This is Audible Bleeding, the vascular surgery podcast. We're here to help you keep your finger on the pulse. Welcome back to Audible Bleeding. We're very excited today to be talking about peer support with Dr. Sheehan, Dr. Coleman, and Dr. Eit. Dr. Malachi Sheehan is a returning guest to Audible Bleeding. He was our third episode actually discussing vascular surgery curriculum and his experience as a surgeon during the Hurricane Katrina. I encourage you to go back and check out that episode if you haven't already. Dr. Sheehan is a professor and chair of vascular and endovascular surgery and the program director for the Vascular Surgery and Integrated Residency and Fellowship at LSU Health Science Center in New Orleans. Hi, Dr. Sheehan. Hi, good to be back. We also have Dr. Don Coleman, who is also a returning guest. She spoke with us on physician burnout in episode 20. She's an associate professor of surgery at the University of Michigan. She's the program director of the Integrated Vascular Surgery Residency Program and Fellowship there. She is also chair of the SVS Wellness Task Force and is here to discuss the results of vascular surgery burnout uh, on today's podcast. Welcome, Dr. Coleman. Thank you. Hi, everybody. And we're excited also to have Dr. John Eit with us. Dr. Eit practices with Texas Vascular Associates at the Baylor Scott and White Hardin Vascular Institute, and he's a professor of surgery at Texas A&M Health Science and the Vice Chair of Surgery at Baylor University Medical Center. He has an interest in surgical education and surgical well-being. Welcome, Dr. Wright. Glad to be here. We'll go ahead and we'll just jump right in. What exactly was the genesis for this peer support group? Okay, it's a, the SVS Wellness Task Force. This started, I think, probably right after I saw Don give a talk at the VAM several years back about burnout and about specifically burnout in vascular surgery. And I'd never heard any of this data and it, to me, I, I remember thinking, well, that can't be right. And then I had to give the next talk, so I forgot all about it. And then the next day, somebody was mentioning one of the studies she had quoted, and just the numbers were outstandingly bad for vascular surgeons, both in time spent in the hospital and burnout and all these metrics. A lot of the studies, though, had been done by the American College of Surgeons about 10 years earlier. So I wrote an editorial kind of condensing all those studies and just thought it was interesting and wasn't really sure how relevant it was to today because things were different. It was, you know, 10 years, a lot had changed. But Ken Slaw, who was the executive director of the SBS, saw it and he grabbed Dawn and I and he and really Dr. Macaroon and the SBS uh, executive council were the ones who were instrumental in kind of forming the task force and trying to get us to figure out what's the current state of vascular surgery and what can we do about it. So when was this? This was about a year ago, or or how long ago was this that the, the you formed task force? Well, we're going on two years now. Yeah, the task force proposal went in in 2016. We went live in 2017. We've had a lot of tremendous support, engaged task force members, and really engaged and important feedback from our membership to guide these early efforts. But this is the first year that we've started to launch what we would consider interventions for our members, and there's still a lot of work to do. So Don, I, I know we already had you on the podcast to discuss this, but maybe if you could just review some of the findings from the survey for our listeners to give a little background as to sort of what the scope of the problem is. Yeah, sure, thanks. So again, as Mel referenced, this was a follow-up almost that was simply specialty specific and contemporary to our membership in 2018. And the task force put together with the assistance of a couple really important collaborators Kate Shanafelt and Susan Hallbeck, a vascular-centric wellness survey that used both validated measures of wellness, but also personalized some questions and also permitted free text we thought that would capture some of the unique characteristics of our specialty. We had a pretty robust response rate and identified a few really important lessons from the survey, and I won't dive too much into the details, but I'll leave you really with the key take-home points. And that was that about a third of the membership that responded met criteria for burnout, and that this specific finding of meeting criteria for burnout also increased the incidence in our membership of both depression and suicidal ideation. With several different analytic ways, we showed independent predictors for burnout being primarily advancing age, physical pain that was associated with some of the ergonomic stressors of our profession, and also work-life conflict, not just from the perspective of not having enough time at home, but when those imbalances came and one was 
um, meant to pick between work or home, perhaps to resolve a conflict, our membership are that we're choosing work, we're at increased risk for burnout. Other factors that bore out as um, important included the self-reported grade of the primary area of work being low in patient quality and safety, and also self-reported medical errors. And this is a really important point that I think we'll speak more to in the coming episode. And finally, we found that women were two times more likely to have thoughts of suicidal ideation in comparison to men. And this was really the only gender-based finding that bore out in our initial survey data. So the likelihood of burnout was similar, but the suicidal ideation was, was twice as high in women. Is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's exactly right. One of the focuses of, the, of your survey determinant was on EMR and how people felt about its use and whether or not that contributed to burnout. And then also Dr. Eid actually wrote an editorial relatively recently on a paper that showed that 20% of residents using the EMR at home were in excess of work hours. How do you think this ever expanding need to monitor and keep up with the EMR all the time is going to affect the future generations when it comes to burnout? And Dr. Eid, you could comment as well. Yeah, I think it's uh, pretty clear that the lines separating formal work hours and what you wind up having to do at home to keep up is being smeared really for everybody, not just trainees, but obviously people in practice. The ACGME, you know, the oversight governing body for uh, residency training, is well aware of this and is doing their best to monitor it. But it is a real challenge because this work is now, we all have access to our work. We can do it on our phones, we can do it on our computers, and we wind up doing it. Uh, 24 hours a day. And this intrusion into private time, into time for reflection, into time for uh, relaxation and, and to recreate yourself with recreation, you know, is a real problem. And exactly how we're going to respond to it, I don't think anybody has a very clear answer. But just recognizing that pajama time is important, that is being able to be away from the stressors of, of work is an important uh, point. It just means the trainees are going through the same thing the attendings are. And so, you know, it's important to, and it, you know, this is why I, I keep harping on EMR because it's a billion dollar industry. And to my inference, there's very little they're doing about this. You know, they, they sell these systems to the hospitals, to the hospital CEOs, and doctors often have very little input into it. And then occasionally, you know, the hospitals say, well, we don't want this one. We're going to make a better margin with this one. So they'll disrupt again and make you learn an entire new EMR system. I think the younger people are better at it. So this should be very eye-opening with Dr. Wright has shown because even though they're better at it and more efficient with it, it's still something that they can't manage in anything that we used to be able to do as trainees. You know, when I was a resident with a paper chart, no charts ever came home with me. Yeah. Occasionally you'd be doing dictations, but it wasn't to this extent. So this is a, a complete infringement on the work hours that we've been doing, both at an attending and a resident level, with really no um, mechanism for fixing it coming from the billion dollar industry that caused it. Yeah, it's very true. I mean, you know, when I started in practice, I would be able to get through all my charts and, and get my dictations done when, with a paper chart usually by the end of the day or the next day. And now it's, it's always a fight to get it done within the, the timeline of a week or else we get, we get, we get uh, fined by our department. And, and I'm seeing the same number of patients I was seeing when I started out, but the, just much more time spent on that stuff. My, my only point is that there, there are obvious benefits to the EMR, and I'm not saying this should go away, and I know it's not going away. But this time, this extra time it takes to do the data entry, that's what we need to figure out. And the burden was placed completely on the physicians in the beginning and up till now, obviously, but I think that that's something that the industry has to account for. The EMR is er erosive in an incremental way in that each new year, we have a new generation of residents coming into training. And if you listen to their orientation at the hospital, they're being instructed to do all kinds of non-therapeutic activities that have nothing to do with being a physician and certainly nothing to do with being a surgeon. And I think that all of us are going to have to push back to start getting back to a point where people are working at their highest level of training. 
you know, uh, a surgeon needs to be making therapeutic decisions. They need to be seeing patients, making diagnosis, conducting therapeutic trials, doing operations, doing data entry and trying to figure out what ICD-10 code applies to somebody's heart failure is of no therapeutic benefit to the patient, is no benefit to the doctor. And I think everyone knows this now, but it's just trying to figure out what the what's the best response and how to make this happen in a way where we can get back to doing the things that we're best trained to do and other people can do the things that uh, they can do. So. so I would agree that probably the EMR is the thing that takes the most time suck. But personally, I find that things that are most emotionally draining and really, and really wear you out as a surgeon are, are sort of the unexpected complications. And maybe you could talk about uh, how you guys deal with that and, and how you see the peer support movement will will maybe help us address some of that stuff. I might start off with this just because it was an area that was completely unknown to me a couple of years ago. I'm this I'm the old guy on this call and I've been through a lot of bad outcomes. If you're a vascular surgeon, you're going to have a lot of bad outcomes. I've certainly had my share. And it struck me that after a particularly unpleasant event a couple of years ago, I thought that I was just completely unprepared to deal with this. I had had no real training. Nobody ever taught me how to respond to adversity. We basically modeled ourselves on our teachers. And most of our teachers taught us to, as in the short term, say, just say, suck it up or walk it off. Uh, get used to it. If the, you know, if the, if the heat's too hot, get out of the kitchen. And I thought that that's just a completely inappropriate way to prepare surgeons for the inevitabilities of adverse events during their careers. And I started asking around different people when I was at meetings. I started asking people, what do you do when you face uh, these challenging cases that have adverse outcomes? And I got some enlightened responses from some chairman. And I got some not so enlightened responses, but I eventually um, met a woman who runs a peer support program at the Brigham and Women's Hospital named Joe Shapiro. I had never even heard the terminology peer support as an, as a, as an entity. And I thought it, it really a light bulb went off in my head. And I thought, this is, this is what I'm talking about. This is what I think we need. Was, was that group geared toward surgeons or was that group uh, like, was it the uh, internal medicine or what was it? It's a, gr it's a great question. And, and the peer support program at the Brigham is really non-specialty specific. It's a kind of a generic support program that's offered at the hospital level. And it's designed to offer kind of a generic support to individuals that are either in medical legal situations or they've got some kind of a adverse outcome or, or some type of a bad event, and they'll reach out to the individual. The problem to me was that as a surgeon, particularly as a vascular surgeon, when I face an adverse event, I don't really want to talk to a counselor who doesn't know what I do. I don't want to talk to a, a nurse, for instance. Surgeons tend to want to talk to surgeons. They trust people who've been in the battle. They, want, they trust people who are in the foxhole with them. They know what it's like to be two o'clock in the morning, and nobody else in the room knows that this case is going downhill except you. And uh, you want to talk to other people that know what that feeling is like when, it, when, the, when, the, when, the, when things are really getting bad. And so I approached Don and Mal and said, you know, could we come up with a way that the Society for Vascular Surgery could develop a program and peer support that's specialty specific, that's really designed for surgeons to learn how to take care of each other in a better way? Now, I'm not saying we all have to be psychiatrists, but we ought to learn some basic skills on how to, to ask the right questions and to learn to listen to each other and then provide some of the support that we need in order to avoid some of these adverse outcomes that we worry about, none the least of which would be substance abuse and depression and suicide and the kind of, you know, down the hill problems that, that are, you know, significant in our specialty. Yeah, peer support is the difference between sympathy and empathy. You know, it, you can have something terrible happen to you and people can feel bad for you, but it doesn't necessarily make you feel better. 
But when you talk to people who actually understand what you're going through, it's a very different process. And this is something that any other profession who does anything similar as far as how traumatic it is to the person is already doing. You know, firefighters, policemen, EMS, they all have established peer support systems. It's just we're very, very late to the game. And hospitals try, but who are our peers in the hospital? And that's really the problem is that, especially for vascular surgery, we often don't have a peer support network locally. So I think people have often informal peer support networks. You know, you talk to, I talk to people that I trained with and people that I trained and some of the people, my mentors, et cetera, et cetera. But how is that different than more formal peer support that you, that you describe like in other professions, like firefighters and EMS and everything, you know? So that's a great question. Um, I can at least speak to our task force and some of the feedback we've gotten from our membership. And to your point, you're exactly right. There are many vascular surgeons out there who have an organic network of peer support. And it's not structured and they've not been trained, but it's effective for them. But there are a lot of members within our task force that don't have that or are in groups where the dynamics aren't as constructive or supportive that they can get outreach support. Perhaps they face criticism. And so one thing that um, has become really clear to me over the course of the evolution of this task force and listening to our membership is that everybody's situation is very, very different. And we have an opportunity, I think, to reach many members that don't have that organic form of peer support. I also just want to suggest that I think that while surgeons and specifically vascular surgeons are innately resilient, as we've talked about before, I think that we are particularly vulnerable to the non-legal ramifications of an adverse outcome. And that's in part because of the skill sets and the personality traits that are required to do the job that we do. We've got really high standards for ourselves and each other. I would say most of us are very type A, we're perfectionists. We also um, draw a tremendous amount of not just personal satisfaction, but accountability for our outcomes. So if there's an, an outcome that is not positive or favorable for our patients, that really gets looked as a um, failure for the surgeon, and that then goes on to really undermine a lot of the other intrinsic value perhaps somebody might feel about themselves. I'm happy to talk about the nuances between organic support and also the, the um, programs that are out there, but I don't know who was going to speak earlier. If John I wants to expand on this because he's had many discussions with Joe Shapiro and her group, I can defer to him. So, Dr. I, how would you characterize the difference between the informal and the more formal uh, peer support groups? Well, first of all, I would say I'm, I'm not aware of any specialty-specific peer support group that's been developed in the country. Uh, most of the peer support programs are hospital-based or institution-based. And so our attempt at the SVS to attack this problem as a, as a national or an international group of vascular surgeons, I think, is something that is relatively unique. I think Don's point that many surgeons do not work in environments that are particularly supportive. You know, in many cases, if you're in a shared expense model, for instance, your partners, your so-called partners, may in fact be your competitors. You may not have anyone in your local environment that you can really go to you know, when you're in a, a, fa a situation where you're really stressed out about something. Your colleagues that are not vascular surgeons, they may be sympathetic, but they really don't know what it is you do or whether you did the right thing or the wrong thing. And so you, you're often left in a situation where you are working in a kind of a vacuum. And so I think one of the ideas of this was that could the SVS really serve uh, this purpose as a, a way to connect people so you don't wind up suffering in silence, which is kind of what we've been trained to do, you know. The other thing I think is kind of an, an interesting point is that most of us come out of a background of science. We go to college, we work in science, we work in these non-liberal arts areas, and we, we get very sort of, in a way, kind of distorted education in that we may have very little personal knowledge about how to deal with emotional issues. And these really are ultimately emotional. As, you know, Ron Fairman was the president of the SVS a couple of years ago, and his presidential address essentially was entitled, It's Personal. 
What we do is very personal. We don't deal with populations of patients, you know. We take care of one patient at a time, and we make a commitment to do the best thing we can for that patient. And when it goes badly, we feel it intensely. And figuring out ways to learn to deal with the inevitability of adversity I think, in a more positive way, is, is essentially what we're trying to do right now. And there's no blueprint for this, so we're kind of learning as we go. So how do we plan on rolling this out? What, what exactly is the plan for what this task force is doing and what it's going to be designed to do specifically? So I'll, I can speak to that a bit and suggest a few things. The task force umbrella is overseeing many concurrent initiatives, of which one is this concept peer support. And that's simply based on the feedback we've gotten from our membership, both in the free text comments, as I've referenced, the fact that having a self-reported adverse outcome is a very clear risk for burnout and depression and suicidal ideation. And also there's fairly good data that would suggest culturing community enhances wellness for physicians. And so while some of this happens at institutional levels across the country, our group is really trying to bring these systematic approaches to the entirety of our membership with a vascular surgeon focus, appropriately so. The peer support program falls under probably a bigger program of what we're calling member support, in which we've um, collaborated with surgeon coaches to help us in this space, because I'm not aware of a large number of vascular surgeons trained in this capacity to respond accordingly and support accordingly. But the peer support programs that are out, though, out there really rest on um, a pretty well-described framework that focuses on preventing second victim syndrome, if you will, through policies that promote physician health and reduce medical errors, but also the mitigation of such a syndrome when it manifests, thinking about acute response teams or first aid almost to the providers, and then supporting providers across the board. And that has a lot to do with cultural changes that become no blame conversations, if that makes sense. And so within the member support program that we're rolling out with the collaboration of Surgeon Masters, our coaching team in the forum of SVS Connect, which is really intended to be a safe space for communication through which any member can you know, sign on and share a story and get a response. The goal being that if there are challenges right now to start, cases that individuals may wanna talk about, there's some discussion online. There is going to be very soon an opportunity for anonymous posts that I think will be helpful for many of our members. But this has the potential to grow in a couple different ways, and we're going to be trialing a few things for our members. And one is that in February, we're really excited to launch a live call during the fourth week of the month. And so the details for that opportunity will be circulating, but it will allow individuals who want to talk with peers and with kind of moderating surgical coaches the opportunity to participate in a live call in that space. And there's also the opportunity for us to train peer supporters and train trainers, if you will, to then be disseminated amongst our societal membership and their own institution to help with kind of desperately needed culture change and be available with best practices that will support our members in need. We'll make sure and get some of those things in our show notes as well, just so people can link to them. That'd be great. Thanks. How do people get involved? Like if this is something you'd be interested in doing, becoming a, a maybe a peer counselor, how can members of the, of the society get involved in this? So I love that question because we want more people to be involved. And that engagement could look a lot of different ways. We are going to be putting forward a call in the near future for new task force membership for folks that haven't necessarily had the opportunity to work with us to date that want to get involved. So we'd encourage interested members to look kind of first and foremost there, but we're also looking for early adopters and early engagers through the platform of SVS Connect and the work that's ongoing with Surgeon Masters. So those individuals that 
want to get involved, want to join the calls, have ideas to share, please participate in the conversations, but also reach out anytime to Dr. Sehan or uh, Dr. Ike or myself, because we would love to, to grow our team. One of the issues with these types of programs is that there's a sense that if you utilize a program like this, it's a sign of weakness. You know, we've been trained not to be weak. We've been trained not to show our feelings. We've been, sh- you know, trained that this is that when all the when everything is going bad, we're the one person that has to be able to keep it under control and be in charge. And the reality is, we all know that that's a that's a heavy burden, and we've. I think that really just shining a light, just allowing members to see that they're, that this is a common experience, that responding to adversity is inevitable in our specialty, that in some ways it's a, just a, a simple Hawthorne effect. You put a light on it and just say, this is something we're all doing, we're all involved in this, may have some positive benefit in and of itself. You know, we talked earlier about resilience. I think most of us recognize that vascular surgeons are probably some of the most resilient people on the planet. I mean, we've self-selected for resilience just by our ability to get through the uh, training programs that we go through. You know, few people take, you know, have more training than we do or or go through a more uh, arduous training process. We've self-selected. We're pretty darn uh, resilient and we're pretty adaptable. What we're talking about now is saying, is there, are there things that systematically that we can develop that will make our lives better and make it easier for us to take care of our patients? Yeah, it's similar to what John said. You know, the enemy is cynicism and the belief not only that this is a sign of weakness, but maybe that it won't work. You know, I, I have 11 vascular surgeons in my group. I'm married to a vascular surgeon. If anybody gets peer support, it should be me. <laughs> I might be the one person who needs less vascular surgeons in yeah. their life. But it's, but it's, so it's, it, but how do I know that we're doing this the right way? You know, none of us were really trained to give peer support. And this absolutely happens when, you know, and it's, it's bad outcomes and malpractice are the number one and number two reasons that people seek peer support, whether officially or unofficially. So we kind of hash it out, but I don't know if I'm doing the right thing. So I would, I would suggest anybody get involved, even if you don't think you necessarily need peer support or don't think it'll work, even as a leadership training exercise, this is, you know, obviously something that's needed and we might as well as a specialty, try to figure out the right, right way to do it. And may I please follow up on two of those points? Because I think they're super important. There were some things that Dr. Eight referenced, focused on our natural resiliency. And Dr. Shahan also made a reference to leadership development. I'll just speak on behalf of somebody who's had a tremendous amount of resiliency training within the U.S. Army. And some of that focuses on these skills that can be coached. So even though we do a really great job, we can probably do a little bit better. And one of the areas that gets coached U.S. soldiers has to do with really having some self-reflection on these deeply held beliefs that can impact how you manage a specific situation. And they refer to these things as icebergs when there's something that's so deeply ingrained in your person that it's hard for you to overcome and work around that. And one of those um, icebergs that had been awfully consistent in the U.S. Army was this sense of asking for help being a weakness, as was just raised. And it's really not. And in fairness, getting back to the leadership component, I think excellent leaders are really human and they also can be extremely authentic. And there is something about calling something what it is that is uncomfortable for everybody that's really, really necessary in this space. And so we are all strong and we are all resilient, but we do really, really hard things. And keeping this profession human is important, especially as we're getting pulled and torn in all of these different directions that are dehumanizing the day-to-day care that we're delivering. So one of the themes that's bearing out of this early collaboration with Surgeon Masters is focused on why burnout is important and why some of these uncomfortable feelings are important. And to be fair, it keeps us really human, and I think it keeps us focused on why we're doing this job. There's been a lot of discussion on not having training and how to deal with some of these things. Uh, It seems like 
one of the obvious answers might be to start incorporating this into training. Is there any thought on how trainees can get involved with this or whether or not we should start making it mandatory practice within vascular surgery training? It's a good question. And I'm actually just recently been appointed to the RRC, the Residency Review Committee for Surgery. And I will assure you that the RRC is in, interested in this topic. But as Mal was saying, I'm not sure anybody really has the best answers for how to do this. And as much as anything, we're trying to develop what really are the best practices now, uh, learning from each other. I'll give you an example. I, I talked to a chairman of surgery not too long ago, and I said, what do you do when one of your junior people come to you and says, you know, I, I had a bad case? And he said, oh, yeah. And he said, uh, yeah, I had a guy came to me last week. He did a couple of big oncology cases, and they both went bad over the weekend. And he came to talk to me on the, the next week, and he was distressed and didn't know what to do. And I said, well, what'd you tell him? He said, well, I told him not to spread it around. And I thought, <laughs> that is not the kind of guidance that you need in that situation. And this is a chairman of department. So I think that w there's a plenty of opportunity for us to learn from each other and figure out what are the best practices. I will give you an example of another chairman I talked to who had a good idea. I, I said, what do you do? He said, I always go to talk to the family with my, with my faculty member. And this does a couple of things. It, it provides support for my faculty member. It shows you're not out there in isolation. He said, it tells the family that this is important, that puts the institutional weight behind this conversation. And it also provides a kind of a, a witness to what disclosure occurred. You know, what was the conversation? Who said what? Because everybody's worried about medical legal issues. That's not a widely known practice amongst chairmen or uh, people in leadership. So I think there's an opportunity for us as a group of surgeons to talk with each other to figure out who's doing it right, who's not doing it right, how do we learn to do it better, and really, again, just shining a light on this and allowing this conversation to occur may be the biggest thing we can do, you know, uh, just getting the conversation started. And I think a forum just like this, I think, is very important to achieve that result. Is there anything else that we haven't touched on yet about the peer support group or the wellness task force that you think you want to highlight? Don, you said that the, the, the wellness task force is an umbrella, and this is only one of the initiatives, but is there anything else you want to talk about? Well, I guess it's probably reasonable to just share. We, we, everything is still very much growing, and so it's not like we have a bunch of formal programs that are rowing out, but there are a lot of other things right now. I think emphasizing the recruitment and engagement for new members is important, and the concept of the live calls is a really big deal because we have kind of a three-month trial to see if it's used by our membership. And so we have February, March, and April to really garner engagement. And I think that's what I'd like this to support most. But I will just suggest that if you want to kind of highlight some other things that are on our radar, we've not done yet a tremendous amount with trainees. And so I really don't want to dive so much into that because there's going to be work with APDVS in this space and some kind of second trial breakouts that are going to cover the resident and fellow trainees. And so it's probably beyond the scope of this call. But I think there's probably a lot that relates to the role of our society in supporting its membership with this, not just the adverse outcomes, but malpractice suits and the ramifications of that, the non-legal ramifications of that the concept of transition into early career and the role for perhaps enhanced surgical coaching and mentorship in this space. And then I think there is really a lot of business to why wellness initiatives and advocacy are important for our specialty. And to be fair, a lot of the other work that's ongoing within the society at a higher level related to the valuation survey, the branding work that's been going on, Essentially, I think we're going to be able to come up with kind of a toolkit for SVS members to advocate for themselves locally, because our struggles really focus on higher level, system level inefficiencies with work that plague physicians across the country that are going to take more than just our SVS combating to have a voice that makes a real impactful change in healthcare. 
but then also these concepts of of community and culture changes and leadership development and things that the SVS is facing head on, which I think is really commendable. Many of these issues are not unique to vascular surgeons. I think it's great that we're getting on board, uh, I guess, early for medical specialists, but are we partnering with, with anybody else outside of the SVS to try to get a bigger voice in this? We, we have looked, and I will tell you that everything is in its infancy, infancy. And one thing we've learned from vascular surgeons is that a lot of our needs are specialty specific. Now, there's common things like EMR and probably even peer support, but how we approach it, it seems to be des- best done from within our own specialty, at least to try to figure out. But we have reached out to the American College Surgeons, and obviously the AMA and bigger organizations have efforts going. But I'll, I'll tell you, with the investment that the SBS has put in us, probably per capita vascular surgeons are approaching it more vigorously than any other specialty. And, you know, we should. We were the ones who all the surveys said we're doing the worst. So I think as a specialty, we owed it to ourselves to really attack this with vigor. But that said, it's not like there's these tremendous wellness initiatives nationally for doctors that are working so well that we can just tag on with them and have success. So we're trying to do it much more organically and much more specifically to what vascular surgeons reported in the large survey we did when we started. And so that's why these initiatives that Dawn mentioned were formed because that's what vascular surgeons said that's what they needed and that's what was bothering them. So I think that you know we're doing this from a much um, much finer approach than someone broad like the AMA. That's right. The other the other thing I'll supplement that with and I echo everything Mal just said. I'll also propose that we've had some early discussions with Michael Goldberg who really works out of the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Care but also is a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. I'm a surgeon if I'm not mistaken and he worked with us early on in the space as we were putting together our task force. And then we've become re-engaged recently as there is discussion from subspecialty groups like ours and HUSNA to put together a collaborative of subspecialties where we may be smaller in number, for example, than the larger groups, but putting together a collaborative where best practices can be shared and then our number of then collective members may be more impactful than resting on the smaller membership of our own respective societies. And so I'm anxious to see where that goes and optimistic that we may get some value out of that as well. The final thing I wanted to make sure we at least introduced or acknowledged, if you wanted to collect any comments that were outside of the space of peer support, really focused on the ergonomics. And I'm Almost certain that you've had Max Wolauer or Sam Money speak on this platform with audible bleeding to that end, but we we have not. But that is something we're very interested in doing. Perfect. And my my knee is still sore from my long case on Friday. I was just telling Max. Yeah, so it's legitimate. Ergonomic challenges and chronic pain continue to be a pretty clean source of 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 distress for our membership, linked in kind of every way we've been able to look with burnout, suicide, and fetal ideation and depression. And so I raise this only to suggest that I think that would be a really good next call because part of what we'll need to do as a task force is figure out now what to do with this pretty compelling theme. We know it's a problem, but how do we as a task force and as a society both help educate our membership and train them to best practices to decrease the ergonomic challenges and pain that's resulting from our day-to-day activities, but also be part of perhaps innovative changes that help us moving forward. Because there are some unique occupational hazards that we face given the combination of advanced endovascular procedures, really long open cases, loop, headlights. There's lots of things we're kind of wearing and it is Nothing that's been revisited probably in decades to be meaningful to enhance the daily practice and experience of the physician. And so I think that that data is really going to come to a head in the next in the next six to 12 months. Yeah, no, I think that that's a very important topic. Hey, Matt, do you want to wrap up? Yeah, thanks very much. This has been a great discussion. I just want to thank Dr. Sheehan, Dr. Coleman, and Dr. Eid for joining us on Audible Bleeding for this very important topic.